All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our Be Empowered webinar. My name is Lisa Rizendi and I'm Vice President of Education here at FORCE. And um, I want to welcome you all and thank you for joining us for our exciting webinar today with Dr. Matthew Letterman. And he'll be talking on exploring your family planning options through assisted reproduction as a cancer pre-viver or survivor. Um, so we're thrilled to have him. For those of you who are not familiar with FORCE, I wanted to let you know a little bit about um, about the series and about our organization. So the way today is going to work is I'm gonna give a brief introduction to FORCE. We will have the presentation by Dr. Letterman. If you have questions, you may write them in the question panel on your, um, on your dashboard there. And I will then present the questions to him at the end of the webinar. You will be on mute as the webinar goes on. So um, the other attendees will not be able to see your questions if you write it in the question box. If you write anything in the chat box, everyone will be able to see it. So FORCE, for those of you who are not familiar with FORCE, FORCE is an organization that is dedicated to improving the lives of individuals and families affected by hereditary breast, ovarian, and related cancers. We serve all people affected by hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and the related cancers, whether you're a survivor or a previvor, somebody with a strong disposition, whether you have a mutation in BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, P10, ATM, CHECK2, any of the number of different mutations that are um, associated with increased cancer risk, these are all served by our organization. If you are considering testing or you have a VUS, we serve your, or you as well, or if you have a strong strong family history of cancer. So we are, our services and our information is available to all segments of the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer community. The way we work is we have a number of different programs to serve the community. We have support programs such as a helpline and local support groups across the country. We've also recently launched our peer navigation program, which you can find out more about on our website, and that will give you information. We have a number of different um, educational programs, including uh, expert reviewed information on our website, our webinar series, and our new x-rays program, which gives expert expert reviewed reviews of um, breast cancer information in the news, and we have a number of advocacy and research initiatives as well. I wanted to point out that our new, next conference, our 10th annual Joining Forces Against Hereditary Cancer conference is in October, October 6th through 8th in Orlando. Registration is now open, and Dr. Letterman, among many other experts, will be speaking at that conference. So please go to the website if you're interested in registering. I also wanted to point out we are still registering participants for the About Patient Powered Research Network. Anybody affected by hereditary breast and ovarian cancer is eligible to enroll. Whether or not you have had cancer, whether or not whatever type of mutation you have, you're eligible to enroll and help us advance research. This is the only research registry developed and governed by and for the HBOC community. If you look at our website, we have featured research on our website. Um, we have a number of different clinical trials for targeted therapies for the HBOC community, including pancreatic cancer studies, ovarian cancer studies, and breast cancer studies. We also have links to other studies of interest to the HBOC community, including links to the research going on with our friends at the Basser Center for BRCA. Um, tomorrow, you'll be emailed a feedback survey. Um, it's a short survey, and it helps us improve the series. So if you could share your thoughts, we would greatly appreciate it. You can also view this webinar and other webinars from our series on the FORCE website. This will be archived next week, and we'll have the link so you can share it with any of your friends or family who might have missed it. So I encourage you all to connect with us at our website, facingourrisk.org. Call our helpline if you are interested in, in obtaining support or follow us through social media. You can also email me at lisar at facingourrisk.org if you have comments on the webinar series. So now I'm going to um, introduce and turn the talk over to Dr. Letterman. Dr. Matthew Letterman is a board certified reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist, and is often acknowledged for his compassionate care, devotion to patients and clinical expertise. He treats patients in New York City at the RMA of New York Westside location, as well as the RMA Westchester office in White Plains. 
Prior to joining RMA of New York in 2014, Dr. Letterman treated patients at the Continuum Reproductive Center at the St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center. After graduating from the University of Michigan, Dr. Letterman received his medical degree from the Chicago Medical School and completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology, as well as his fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Montefiore Medical Center. During his residency, he served as the administrative chief resident and also received the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University Teaching Award two years in a row. While in fellowship, Dr. Letterman was acknowledged by the Endocrine Society for his research and received a travel grant. He served on the Medical Advisory Board of FORCE and is a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He's a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, Society of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, Endocrine Society, Westchester OBGYN Society, and Resolve. He was also named to the 2015 and 2016 Super Docs in the New York edition. Dr. Letterman's published scientific articles and abstracts in peer-reviewed journals in the fields of endocrinology and infertility, and has presented his research at national conferences. He has extensive clinical experience in um, all areas of fertility, including unexplained infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, in vitro fertilization, egg freezing, and pre-implantation genetic screening. So I hope that you all are going to enjoy his seminar today on exploring your family planning options through assisted reproduction as cancer previvor or survivor. I'm going to turn the controls over to Dr. Letterman, and thank you so much for speaking for us today. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. So once again, my name is Dr. Matthew Letterman, and I'm part of the RMA New York team. And uh, we are affiliated with the Mount Sinai Hospital System in New York. And like, I'm personally, I see patients at our Westchester location, White Plains, as well as our West Side location in Manhattan. Dr. Letterman, we're not seeing your yes. screen. Uh, okay, show my, can you see it now? Yes, we can see it now, thank you. Okay, I, I didn't click on the uh, button. No. All right. So we're all good? We're good. All right. So today we're going to talk about oncofertility. We're going to talk about egg freezing and embryo freezing related to this. We'll talk about BRCA and fertility. We'll talk about informational needs of BRCA carriers related to reproduction, as well as fertility options that are available to BRCA carriers or cancer previvors. So cancer affects many women while in their childbearing years. And in the United States annually, a little under 800,000 women are diagnosed with cancer. And of these women, a little under 10% are under the age of 40. And as survivorship increases, challenges in restoring quality of life post-treatment arise, including maintaining one's fertility. So a delay in childbearing combined with improvements in cancer survival rates, have resulted in more and more women having not had children at time of their cancer diagnosis and requiring fertility preservation. So oncofertility is a combination of oncology as well as reproductive medicine that expands fertility options for cancer survivors. And a significant proportion of young women who are diagnosed with cancer are given the opportunity to preserve their fertility before undergoing gonadotoxic treatment. Gonadotoxic treatment refers to treatment that could interfere with the function of one's ovaries. So chemotherapy can be very harmful to the ovaries. And the degree of harm to the ovaries is dependent on a few factors. Probably the most important factor is the type of chemotherapy. So cyclophosphamide, which is an alkylating agent, is at high risk for causing ovarian cancer. And this type of chemotherapy is often used to treat early stage breast cancers. Other factors that may influence how harmful it could be to the ovaries include the dose of the chemotherapy, as well as the age of the patient at time of the chemotherapy. And older patients have less ovarian reserve and therefore at highest risk of developing ovarian failure following chemotherapy. So ovarian reserve is a term that infertility specialists frequently use to refer to the egg quality and egg quantity of the patient. 
And we measure this by doing certain blood tests, which I'll talk a little bit later on, as well as doing an ultrasound looking at one's follicle count in the ovaries. So in reproductive age women who are, have breast cancer and are treated with chemotherapy, more than 50% of women over the age of 40 may experience ovarian failure compared to 30% with those under the age of 35. And the loss of ovarian function may be permanent or temporary with temporary lack of menstrual cycle. And one important thing to remember is that just because someone has a period or regular cycles following chemotherapy, that does not necessarily mean that one be able to get pregnant in the future. And there's no data to suggest that chemotherapy can directly damage the uterus. So patients who have undergone cancer treatment without fertility preservation have a substantial decrease in their future fertility. And among female cancer survivors that did not use fertility preservation, there is an increase in use of IVF as well as significant decrease in first-time parenthood probability. And outcome data in several studies assessing the ovarian function following cancer treatment is often limited because it really does not tell the entire story. Because most of these studies use men's rather than uh, getting pregnant as an endpoint. And as I mentioned earlier, just because someone has a period or bleeding or regular cycles after chemotherapy, that does not necessarily mean that they will be able to get pregnant. So in terms of pregnancy following a cancer treatment, there appears to be no increase in maternal morbidity and mortality in pregnancies of healthy female cancer survivors who are in remission. And cancer recurrent rates have not been shown to increase after pregnancy. There is also no difference in the incidence of genetic or chromosomal anomalies in children who are born to parents with a history of cancer or cancer treatment. There is also no increase in childhood malignancies in the offspring of these patients with the exception of cancers who arise as a result of inherited cancer syndromes. And IVF with PGD, which stands for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, can be performed in these situations to screen out such conditions, therefore eliminating the presence of the genetic abnormality in their offspring. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later on. So ovarian stimulation for embryo cryopreservation, embryo freezing, or mature oocyte cryopreservation, which is egg freezing, is the best method we have to preserve one's reproductive potential in women of reproductive age who are undergoing cancer treatment. And cryopreservation refers to the cooling of cells or tissues to sub-zero temperatures in order to stop all biologic activity and preserve them for future use. So early results with egg freezing were very disappointing. And the reason these results were disappointing were because it did not work that well. And the reason for that is you go to unfreeze the eggs, thaw the eggs, a lot of the eggs would not necessarily survive, and therefore lower fertilization rates and pregnancy rates. And the reason the process was not you know, well established at that time because the technique initially used was a process called slow freezing. And this process uh, results in the formation of ice crystals when the eggs are frozen, and ice crystal formation is you know, that causes a damage to the, uh, to the eggs. So over the course of time, with improvement in technology and technique, we've modified how we freeze eggs and how we freeze embryos. And we've used different uh, forms of crop practice. And we've also modified the procedure. So we now freeze eggs the same way that we freeze embryos, which is a process called vitrification. So vitrification is a process of crop preservation using high concentrations of and ultra rapid cooling to solidify the cell into a glass-like state 
without the formation of these crystals. So over the last few years, we've there have been numerous studies demonstrating superior results from vitrification compared to the slow technique. So with vitrification, we have a much higher survival rate of the eggs when they're thawed, also much higher fertilization rates, embryo development, and also much higher rates. And studies also show that using vitrified eggs, the success rates from using them are very similar to that of using fresh eggs in an IVF cycle. And vitrified eggs have a comparable fertilization rate, embryo development, development rate, as well as pregnancy rates compared to using fresh eggs. So because of this, in 2012, ASRM, which is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, which is the uh, infertility governing agency in the United States, they revised their committee opinion on egg freezing and stated it's no longer experimental and vitrification is the preferred method to cryopreserve eggs. And they were able to make this statement because we had good evidence that fertilization and pregnancy rates were similar to that of doing fresh IVF. Also, you know, another important point is there was good evidence that it was safe. So th from you, when you use eggs, the, uh, when you use frozen eggs, studies show there's no increase in chromosome abnormalities, birth defects, or developmental deficits, deficits in offspring from egg freezing. So once again, because we demonstrated that it's effective and safe, ASRM no longer considered it experimental. So a frequent question when discussing egg freezing with patients is a number of eggs required to maximize the chance of future success in the future. But this is a difficult question to answer because everyone is very different based on one's egg quality. And the best approach is to equate it to one's chronological age. So the success of getting pregnant in the future from freezing eggs is, you know, the best way to look at it is compared to someone with age match fertility, meaning that someone who's freezing their eggs at age 37, their chance of success is similar to someone who's 35, who's undergoing IVF for infertility treatment. Another important thing to remember is that one egg does not necessarily equal one baby. So the ideal number you know, varies based on the patient's age, based on the desired family size, as well as one's finances. And truly, there's no right or wrong answer. And in general, a, a, a typical goal is about 20, 10 to 20 mature eggs. And there was a recent abstract that was presented at ASRM in 2015, so the annual ASRM conference, and they looked at the number of mature eggs needed to achieve a live birth. And they found that for women under the age of 35, it required eight mature eggs. For women aged 35 to 37, 10 mature eggs, and for women 38 to 40, about 14 mature eggs. So one of the common concerns with you know, women who are going to freeze eggs or freeze embryos is that if they did these you know, treatment cycles, would that delay affect the overall outcome? And a lot of situations, you know, patients who are diagnosed with cancer sometimes have more time before they may initiate cell therapy. They may not start right away. In those instances, what we typically do is we typically start a cycle with one's period. And it takes about two weeks from the start of the cycle to the retrieval to when we get the eggs. However, in other circumstances or other situations, depending on the type of cancer and how aggressive it is, the oncologist might prefer to, you know, might prefer to start treatment sooner rather than later. So in those situations, what we could do is we could actually start the stimulation medications at any time throughout the menstrual cycle. And once again, I said it takes about two weeks to get to retrieval. So from time of referral to the time of a retrieval and then starting chemotherapy, it may just be a little bit more than two weeks. So it's actually not that big of a delay. And we also speak with the oncologist prior to starting any of these cycles to make sure it's safe for that patient. 
Another common fear regarding you know, uh, doing these cycles is whether or not the stimulation medications may be harmful to the malignant cells. With that being said, there's no evidence of any adverse effects on the fertility medications in terms of cancer outcomes. Also, for breast cancer patients, we use a medication called an aromatase inhibitor, such as letrozole, which keeps the estrogen levels very low during the stimulation cycle, therefore making it more safe for the patient. So what does a typical IVF or egg freeze cycle involve? Well, it, the first thing that we do is we teach the patients how to, how to administer these stimulation medications. So each patient takes about two to three injections a day, and these injections are tiny insulin-like needles, so they're, they're a subcutaneous injection given in the lower abdomen. And we teach the patients how to administer these, these shots. And we then follow the patient every two or three days with an ultrasound. And these are quick visits, the early morning, we get the patient in and out, and we monitor the dose accordingly. And it's about five to six, five to six visits during a cycle. And typically the patients are on these injections for about 10 days, and then when they have a few good-sized follicles, they take what's called the trigger shot. And the egg retrieval is then done 36 hours following the trigger shot, and that's done in our IVF lab, which in a, you know, for our program is in Manhattan. And the egg retrieval procedure is done under IV sedation given by an anesthesiologist. Using a vaginal ultrasound, the ovaries are then you know, punctured with the needle uh, into the follicles, and we then aspirate the eggs. And the egg retrieval procedure is a minimally invasive procedure that takes less than 15 minutes to complete. We then recover the patients for about an hour, and they go home feeling a little sore, kind of bad peer-like pain, and as the day goes on, they often feel much better, and even better by the following day. And for patients who need to go to work, almost all patients go to work the following day. When we freeze eggs, we then freeze eggs on the same day that we do the egg retrieval. For patients who freeze embryos, we combine the sperm and eggs in a dish, we grow the embryos out, and then we freeze the embryos on day five or day six at the blastocyst stage. So for couples who, you know, who are doing regular IVF or you know, you know, standard IVF, when we're putting the embryos back, the embryo transfer procedure is done also in our IVF lab. That's done while the patient's awake. There's no IV sedation. We, have, we do an abdominal ultrasound. It involves a speculum exam. And then a tiny catheter is placed through the cervix into the uterus, and we watch where we release the embryos. And it takes only a few minutes to perform the transfer. For patients who are freezing eggs at some point in the future, if they ever want to use them, we unfreeze the eggs, combine it with the sperm, and we grow and we grow the embryos out. And while we do that, we the you know the you know the patients take some hormones to get the lining ready, and they then undergo the embryo transfer. For patients who have frozen embryos, we then uh, have the patient take some hormones to get the, the uh, endometrial lining ready, and we then start the embryos, and they then undergo the embryo transfer. So the ideal interval between diagnosis and or treatment of cancer and then trying to get pregnant is unknown. And breast cancer patients who did not require any adjuvant treatments such as tamoxifen are generally advised to wait about two years after diagnosis and treatment before trying to get pregnant. With that being said, data is overall limited and therefore each decision regarding pregnancy timing must be made on, the, on an individualized basis and is often made in consultation with one's oncologist. So now we're going to shift gears and talk a bit about BRCA. So BRCA mutations carriers have an estimated 60 to 80 percent lifetime risk of developing breast cancer and about a 10 to 54 percent lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer. And for women in the general population, the lifetime risk for breast cancer is about 13%, and for ovarian cancer, a lifetime risk a little over 1%. And 
And children of BRCA mutation carriers have a 50% 50 chance of inheriting the mutation. And these patients who are BRCA mutation carriers have the option of undergoing IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, to prevent the transmission of the gene to the offspring. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit. So women with a BRCA mutation, so a cancer previvor, may consider a prophylactic salpingo-oophorectomy, which is the excision of the fallopian tubes and ovaries in order to decrease the chance of cancer. Guidelines recommend a risk-reducing bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, or BSO, between the ages of 35 to 40, or individualized based on the age of onset of ovarian cancer in a family member, and once childbearing is complete. And studies show that a BSO significantly reduces the risk of ovarian cancer, as well as breast cancer in premenopausal women. And medical interventions to reduce cancer risk or treat malignancy often elicit fertility and family planning concerns among young BRCA mutation carriers. So there have been numerous studies over the last few years that suggest that BRCA mutation carriers may have decreased ovarian reserve compared to with women without a BRCA mutation, as well as an early age of natural menopause. So if you remember that what I said earlier is that ovarian reserve is a term we use to refer to one's uh, egg quality and quantity. And we do this by measuring uh, what we call an FSH, an extra dial level, and this is done on day two or day three of a period. Uh, and a high FSH on the first few days of the period may indicate that the brain is trying to compensate and work harder for ovaries that don't work as well. FSH levels are very variable. They tend to fluctuate with one's period. A better blood test to check one's ovarian reserve is an AMH, which stands for anti-malarian hormone. And it's more of a global marker of one's ovarian reserve. And the AMH level also tends to correlate what we see on ultrasound when we look at the ovaries. So when we do a vaginal ultrasound and look at one's ovaries, you know, patients have thousands and thousands of eggs and follicles, but you can only see, they have thousands of eggs, but at one given time, you only could see a subset of follicles. So the fewer follicles we would see, the more concerning that would be. So when we do an ultrasound, we're looking at what's called a follicle count. Just, and that gives, gives us an idea of what the ovarian reserve is like. So there have been various studies that suggest that BRCA mutation carriers, so cancer previvors, have low ovarian reserve. They have lower AMH levels. Studies have also shown that uh, you know, BRCA mutation carriers who undergo IVF treatment may not do as well compared to non-BRCA mutation carriers. And some studies also suggest that they may have an earlier age of natural menopause. With that being said, there are, are some other studies that have failed to demonstrate an association between BRCA status and fertility. So BRCA carers are faced with difficult issues regarding the desire to conceive. And one factor that may influence a BRCA carer's decision on trying to get pregnant is whether or not they plan to undergo a risk-reducing surgery, a bilateral subtenuphorectomy at BSO and also what age. Another factor that may influence a BRCA carrier's decision on trying to get pregnant includes the possible risk for diminished ovarian reserve. Also, the risk of passing on the mutation to their offspring also may influence their decision. And as I stated earlier, 50% of their offspring will be a carrier. Other factors that may influence a BRCA carrier's decision on trying to get pregnant include how old they are, whether or not they're single or married, and what size family they ultimately desire. And in a little bit, we're going to talk about how these various factors influence what kind of options they have in terms of doing any form of treatment or monitoring. So what options do BRCA mutation carriers or cancer previvors have? Well, one option they have is oocyte cryopreservation or, or egg freezing. And this may be an option to someone who is single or is not in a committed relationship. 
And this may be a viable option for older women who are single and are considering a risk-reducing BSO at some point in the near future. Or this may be an option to younger women but have diminished ovarian reserve. In the future, we can then thaw these eggs and fertilize them, and they could, these developing embryos can also undergo PGD to try and screen out the BRCA mutation. So another option that these patients have is embryo cryopreservation or embryo freezing. And this may be an option to someone who is married or in a committed relationship. And this may be a viable option to someone who is older and is considering a risk-reducing BSO in the near future prior to completing their ideal size family. Or this may be an option to younger women who have diminished ovarian reserve. And once again, PGD can be performed on these embryos to prevent the transmission of the genetic mutation. So for women and couples who want to be more conservative but still want to be somewhat proactive, they may elect to monitor the ovarian reserve annually. As, these, as, as I stated earlier, some studies suggest they are at increased risk of developing with diminished ovarian reserve. So they may elect to monitor the ovarian reserve annually by doing blood, by checking an AMH level, and undergoing a focal scan of the ovary. Or another option for these patients is to do no fertility-related treatment or monitoring. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, is a diagnosis of a genetic condition prior to achievement of a pregnancy. And PGD identifies embryos that are predicted to be affected with the genetic disease, such as BRCA in this case, and those that are not. Therefore, allowing couples to prevent a pregnancy with a genetic condition. And PGD is the only way to determine whether an embryo is predicted to be affected with the genetic condition prior to achieving a pregnancy. And couples who are utilizing PGD, it requires blood work from both the patient and the partner in order to create what's called a DNA probe for the specific mutation. And what the lab does is they create basically a linkage marker which allows them to look at the embryo and target that embryo's specific genetic mutation. And it takes about one to two months in order to create this specific probe. So an IVF cycle involving PGD includes the process of fertilizing the eggs, culture of the embryo to the blastocyst stage, biopsy of the embryo, freezing the embryo by vitrification, and DNA analysis to determine if the embryo carries the mutation for the specific disease, in this case, the BRCA mutation. So aneuploidy screening allows for assessment of chromosomal abnormalities within the embryo. And these include things like Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, trisomies, and various other chromosomal abnormalities. So aneuploidy which is a chromosomally abnormal embryo, is a leading cause of implantation failures and miscarriages after an IVF cycle. Aneuploidy also increases with increasing maternal age and is a reason why older women have lower pregnancy rates as well as higher miscarriage rates in IVF cycles. And in this day and age, almost all PGD cycles also uh, involve aneuploidy screening. So using the same biopsy specimen that for PGD, these same cells are also analyzed for aneuploidy. And this is also known as PGS, which is pre-implantation genetic screening, or CCS, comprehensive chromosomal screening. And this process allows the identification of the single healthiest and unaffected BRCA-negative euploid embryo. So euploid meaning chromosomally normal. And these embryos are later thawed and transferred in a frozen embryo transfer cycle. Excess euploid and unaffected BRCA negative embryos can be safe for future attempts at pregnancy since these embryos can remain frozen indefinitely.
So here's an actual biopsy of a blastocyst embryo. So once again, this is a day five, day six embryo, and the hatching cells, which is called the trophectoderm, which are cells destined to become the placenta, so it's not traumatic to the embryo. These cells are then aspirated by a suction pipette, and then using a pulse laser beam, these cells are then transected, and these cells are sent to the specialized genetics laboratory to be analyzed. And it takes about one to two weeks to get the results. So in 2009, at the uh, annual Force National Conference, there was a focus group that was put together to assess the informational needs of BRCA mutation carriers regarding issues of fertility and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis options. And the results of this focus group highlighted the important psychosocial concerns and informational needs within this patient population. And they explored the informational needs of women who are BRCA carriers regarding issues of reproduction and views on PGD. And the study demonstrated that BRCA carriers has special informational needs regarding issues of cancer prevention, fertility options, as well as the need for psychosocial support from healthcare professionals. And participants believed that information about fertility options and PGD was not well discussed by healthcare providers at that time. So although BRCA carers can pursue parenthood through things like adoption and egg donation, majority of individuals preferred having their own biological children. They also found that there were feelings of guilt about transmitting the mutation to future children. Some of the group thought it may be selfish to have children knowing the BRCA mutation could be transferred to their offspring. They also found that the limited quantity of information about fertility options was disappointing at that time. Most of the group felt a sense of responsibility to take advantage of PGD technology, but thought a lack of information about the process and procedures existed. Many of the group reported their genetic status had an impact on their relationships with their partners or family in relation to future mothering. And all women in the group knew they wanted to have a child or more children in the future, but felt pressured to make quick decisions. Some of the group had more concerns about having daughters rather than sons. And the majority agreed that even if PGD and IVF were not pursued, there was an implied responsibility to at least consider options. Ethical concerns focused largely on decisions about discarding an embryo if the mutation was found. And although participants had concerns about PGD, many believed the possibility of having a child free from BRCA outweighed the ethical concerns related to destruction of embryos on basis of disease status. But there were some who thought that PGD might be a form of either discrimination against potential disease sufferers. And overall, they felt a strong desire for assistance with decision making, and they found and they thought that a new and there was a need for a new era of family health professional, and preferred to receive PGD information in an organized and systemic manner from a professional devoted to working solely with BRCA mutation carriers. So interestingly, over the last six years or so, not much has changed in terms of how much information is available to these patients, as well as, you know, a lot of this still, you know, their desires and needs at that time are still desires and needs that patients these days still find, find to have. And but there's still a lack of overall information. And you know, these points are highlighted 
in two abstracts that were presented at ASRM. So in 2013, there was a group that looked at BRCA mutation carriers, and they found that most women with a BRCA mutation were interested in fertility preservation, consultation, and treatment if they had not yet completed childbearing at time of screening. And they found that this well-educated group had limited knowledge about the clinical impact or risk-reducing surgery on subsequent fertility or the benefit of a fertility preservation consultation with egg or embryo banking before a risk-reducing surgery. And this group also found that BRCA-positive women tended to report more difficulties with conceiving. And they concluded that a targeted referral for, for fertility preservation consultation at time of BRCA screening may help women improve knowledge and allow improved decision-making about one's reproductive options. Similarly, there was another abstract that presented, in, uh, presented at the ASRM uh, this past year in 2015 and looked at you know, uh, uh, BRCA mutation carriers, the cancer previvors, and they found that the knowledge of the BRCA carrier status impacted behaviors regarding marriage and childbearing and the majority of BRCA carriers believe that PGD and prenatal diagnosis should be offered. And this group concluded that a BRCA carrier's desire and would benefit from reproductive counseling after being informed of their carrier status. So despite our understanding of the medical implications of the BRCA mutation, there is still limited data on how knowledge and carrier status influences decisions about reproduction and parenthood. And BRCA carriers may benefit from reproductive counseling after being informed of their carrier status and therefore improve knowledge and allow improved decision making about one's reproductive options. So when it comes to you know, breaking down what options these patients have, I think the simplest way to do it is break it down based on a few factors. For example, one thing that I think determines what options they have is whether or not they plan to do PGD either now or sometime in the future. Also, how old they are, whether or not they have ovarian reserve issues, and whether or not they're single or married. So what I did was I tried to create a flow diagram to try and simplify these options. So in this diagram, we're looking at women who plan to utilize PGD either now or at some time in their future. So for women under the age of 35 who have diminished ovarian reserve and are single, they have the option to freeze one's eggs. For women under the age of 35 who have diminished ovarian reserve and are married, they have the options to do, do IVF, to, to do PGD, and therefore also bank embryos for future use. For women under the age of 35 who have normal ovarian reserve and are single, they have the option to freeze one's eggs. Um, or if they are not ready to freeze eggs but still want to be proactive, we can monitor the ovarian reserve annually, and if things worsen, we could then maybe screen their egg, we could then freeze their eggs at that time. For married women who have normal ovarian reserve and under 35, they have the option to do IVF, PGD, and bank the embryos for future use. Or once again, if they're not ready to, you know, to do IVF but still want to be proactive, we can monitor the ovarian reserve. And if things change over time, they could freeze uh, the embryos at that time. So the one thing that I also want to mention is that for women who know that they want to do PGD, either now or in the future, to screen out the BRCA mutation, it, to, it makes the most sense to, to do these procedures when they're younger. And the reason for that is the younger you are when one does the IVF, the higher the success rates are. So if you know you're going to do this, you know, if you know you're going to do PGD, it makes sense to take advantage when you're younger because the success rates are going to be higher. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times we're also screening these embryos for a chromosome aneuploidy. So when you have a chromosomally normal embryo, 50% of the embryos are going to be affected with the BRCA gene. So you're going to already cut in half half of the pool. So that's why 
it makes the most sense if you want to do something like this to do it when you're younger because you're going to have higher success rates when, when it comes to using them. So for women who are older than 35 but still want to do PGD, I think their options are you know, slightly different but similar. And the reason for that is that for these women who are over 35, a lot of these patients might consider a risk-reducing BSO at, at some point in the near future. So women over the age of 35 who plan to do PGD either now or sometime in the near future, if they have diminished ovarian reserve and are single, they have the option to freeze one's eggs. If they're married, they have the option to do IVF, PGD to screen out the BRCA mutation, as well as bank embryos for future use. For women with normal ovarian reserve, I think their options are similar. If they're single, freeze eggs. If they're married, IVF, PGD to screen out the BRCA mutation, and bank embryos possibly for future use. So when it comes to you know, women and couples who did not plan to undergo PGD to prevent transmission of the BRCA mutation, I think their options are slightly different and varied. So for women under the age of 35 who have diminished ovarian reserve and are single, they have the option to still freeze eggs or if they're not ready to freeze eggs but want to do, still want to do something proactively, we can monitor the ovarian reserve annually, and if things change and the ovarian reserve worsens, we could always freeze the eggs at that time. For married women who are under 35 and in diminished ovarian reserve, they could still do IVF and bank embryos without undergoing PGD. So they could still bank embryos for future use to create the ideal size family without doing PGD. Or you know, if it, you know, they're not ready to do IVF but want to do something, in, you know, proactively, we could still monitor ovarian reserve, and if things worsen, they could do IVF bank embryos at that time, or they can try and get pregnant on their own. For women with normal ovarian reserve who are single, you know, they could, you know, we, they have the option to freeze eggs, or once again, if they're not ready to commit to freezing eggs but want to do something, they can we can monitor the ovarian reserve and the thing chains freeze eggs at a later date. For married women with the normal ovarian reserve, they still have the option to do IVF and bank embryos, once again, without PGD, or if they're not ready to do that but want to do something, we can monitor the ovarian reserve, and if that worsens over the course of time, they can elect to you know, do IVF bank embryos at, the, at a later date, or they can try and get pregnant on their own. For women who are old, who are over the age of 35 and are not interested in PGD, you know, once again, I think their options are a little bit different because some of these patients, once again, may be undergoing a risk-reducing BSO in the near future. So for these women who are over 35 and have diminished ovarian reserve, if they're single, they have the option to freeze eggs. If they're married, they have the option to do IVF and bank embryos, once again, without doing PGD or they can try and get pregnant on their own. For women with normal ovarian reserve over the age of 35, if they're single, they have the option to freeze eggs, or if they're married, they can still do IVF and bank embryos without PGD, or they can try and get pregnant on their own. The other thing that I want to point out is that for you know, women and couples who are electing to either freeze eggs or embryos or do PGD, when it, com when it comes to picking a program, to do these type of procedures, you want to pick a program that has a top-notch laboratory. Because when it comes to IVF programs, all labs are not created equal. And pregnancy rates vary drastically based on one's you know, lab. And these success rates are actually available to patients uh, online uh, looking at a website called SART. And the reason I think it's very important to do these type of procedures at a top-notch laboratory because for some patients, they might not have the option to try a second time. You know, for, you know, for patients who do IVF because of infertility, if they don't get pregnant, they have the option to find another program and try again. For a lot of patients who are freezing eggs or embryos in, uh, with a BRCA mutation, some of these patients may have taken out the ovaries already and they don't have a second option. So I can stress enough to everyone that when you do these procedures, you want to pick a program 
that, ha that has a top-notch laboratory and is skilled with freezing eggs, they do a lot of cycles, and they also do a lot of PGD. So I thought it would be useful to run through some clinical scenarios. So here we have a 30-year-old BRCA carrier, so a cancer previvor, who is single, and in the future she would like to prevent passing on the BRCA mutation. What options does she have now? So she can freeze her eggs now, and in the future she can thaw her eggs, fertilize them, and then undergo PGD, prevent transmission of the BRCA mutation. Here we have a 33-year-old BRCA carrier, so cancer provider, who is married. She would like to have two kids in the future, but they're not ready to try and get right now, and want to delay you know, trying to conceive for about two years. She would also like to prevent passing on the BRCA mutation. What can they do? So the couple can freeze embryos now after undergoing PGD. And once again, most patients who also do PGD also, uh, under, uh, also use aneuploidy screening at the same time. And when the couple is ready to start the family, they can undergo a frozen embryo transfer cycle with a single embryo that's unaffected and chromosomally normal. Here we have a 39-year-old recently diagnosed with BRCA who is single and plans on undergoing a risk-reducing BSO at some point in the near future. She would like to have kids in the future. What can she do? So she can freeze her eggs now prior to undergoing the risk-reducing BSO. So here we have a 37-year-old recently diagnosed BRCA carrier who just got married. She would like to undergo a risk-reducing BSO, but ideally would like to have two kids. What can she do? So the couple can freeze embryos now prior to the risk-reducing BSO and also have the option of undergoing PGD if they are interested. When the couple is ready to start the family, they can then undergo a frozen embryo transfer cycle. So we, I know we've been talking about different options for BRCA, you know, carriers for the cancer previvors, um, but I think an important question to ask is, are these treatments safe for these patients? And there was a recent study published a few months ago in Fertility and Sterility that looked at this. And in general, information for women at increased risk of developing ovarian cancer due to BRCA is limited. But given the possible mechanisms underlying the pathogenesis of ovarian cancer, it is plausible that fertility treatment may exert a cancer-promoting effect by stimulating multiple ovulations. With that being said, this study, as well as a few other studies, suggested that treatment for infertility did not significantly increase the risk of ovarian cancer among women with a BRCA mutation. And similarly, um, some of these same investigators you know, found that there's no harmful effect on fertility medication on BRCA-associated breast cancer. So it appears to be safe for these patients based on these studies. So in summary, embryo and egg freezing are the best methods to preserve one's reproductive potential in women who are diagnosed and treated for cancer. And despite our understanding of the medical implications of the BRCA mutation, there is still limited data on how the knowledge of the carrier status influences decisions about reproduction and parenthood. Women at risk for development of cancer need a healthcare professional to discuss not only the medical implications of their carrier status or risk-reducing options, but also information regarding fertility preservation and PGD. And BRCA carriers, so cancer previvors, may benefit from reproductive counseling after being formed of their carrier status and therefore improve their knowledge and allow improved decision making about one's reproductive options. And that w one important take home message is that there's no one size fits all treatment option that exists. 
So there are some options for these patients who have who are cancer previvor. They could freeze eggs. They could freeze embryos. They could do PGD. We can monitor the ovarian reserve. Or, you know, the, the, these same patients could do nothing when it comes to fertility or fertility-related monitoring. So I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to talk and open up the audience for any questions that I can answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Letterman. I think that was a fantastic um, uh, review of the different options that we have. Uh, as always, with anything in the HVOC community, there are a lot of choices and very personal decisions to make, and the more data that we have to make these decisions, the better. So we really thank you for your time. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the question box. I have a couple of here that I'm going to present, and I will present them. Um, the first question is, do you feel there's an increased incidence of endometriosis in BRCA or breast cancer patients, and do you know of any good controlled studies in regard to this issue? I can't say that there's any definitive studies that show, you know, endometrio increase in endometriosis in these patients. Uh, you know, endometriosis is a, is a common risk factor for infertility. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of patients who have minimal amount of endometriosis or a lot of endometriosis. And when it comes to fertility, you know, you know, you know, these, you know, you know, these patients, you know, sometimes do inseminations or, you know, can do IVF. But one interesting thing that, you know, you know, that may be brought up is some patients who have endometriosis, they have some recent studies have suggested that, you know, they have, a, you know, that they may have a higher incidence of diminished ovarian reserve. But back to the original question, I can't say there's any study that's linked BRCA uh, or breast cancer to endometriosis. Thank you. Um, the second question, a lot of these, uh, we talked a lot about after oophorectomy and, and implantation after that. Um, the question is, if the patients had ovarian cancer and they needed an oophorectomy, would you consider leaving the uterus or would that be an option in order for them to have children later on? So both, you know, in the previvor situation and in like an early ovarian cancer situation. Well, in, you know, in terms of, you know, I think that's a very different question. Um, so someone who has, you know, cancer um, and is undergoing, you know, you know, cancer treatment, in a lot of those situations, they're removing, you know, the uterus at the time. It's part of the staging, you know, procedure. So having cancer is, a, is very different than someone who is a cancer previvor who doesn't have cancer, but undergoing a, you know, uh, risk-reducing BSO to eliminate the chance of future uh, ovarian cancer. In those cases, a lot of times they don't have to, you know, remove, you know, the uterus. Excellent. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is the average cost for PGD, IVF, and egg th freezing, and are these um, procedures covered by insurance? Well, when it comes to cost, it, you know, it varies, you know, uh, depends on what kind, of, what you're doing. So when it comes to insurance, some insurances will cover, you know, IVF. You know, some insurance, well, very few insurances will cover egg freezing unless it's, you know, they're diagnosed with cancer. Uh, when it comes to PGD, most insurances don't cover PGD, but some insurances, uh, you know, will cover it if there is a genetic reason, such as cystic fibrosis carriers, such as BRCA. So if they have IVF coverage, they might cover a portion of the PGD. For someone who nothing is covered, you know, fr you know freezing eggs sometimes um, can cost up to $10,000. Doing PGD, you know, it, in a cycle, it's, you know, it could get more expensive than that, but it depends on uh, insurance coverage. It depends on, you know, are you also doing annual employee screening at the same time? So it, you know, unfortunately it can get expensive, but there are some insurances that will cover it. Thank you. Um, next question is, does taking birth control for an expended, extended period of time increase or decrease the chances of success with IVF? Taking birth control pills 
neither increases or decreases IVF success rates. So that, you know, that does not influence, you know, one success rate from doing IVF. And in some cycles, actually, for some women, we actually use a birth control pill for a few weeks prior to initiating an IVF cycle. It helps us time things better, and it quiets the ovaries and uterus. Excellent. Um, so going back to the uterus issue now, if we're looking at a previvor, um, could a previvor then consider leaving the uterus and supplementing with HRT to maintain the pregnancy? Is that a possibility? That is possible. That's what we do. You know, same concept for someone who's in ovarian failure, who's in an early menopause, or some younger women experience an early menopause. And for them, once we have you know an embryo, you know, they just take some estrogen pills to get the lining ready, and then we add progesterone, and then they undergo the embryo transfer. So in those cases, a pre who's taking out their ovaries but has a uterus, we supplement them with some hormones to maintain uh, the pregnancy early on before the pregnancy itself takes over. Excellent. And that's all the questions I have coming up here. I'm going to give everyone a second to make sure there's no other ones. But I really want to once again thank you for going through in such a nice stepwise manner the different options that are available to people with hereditary cancer when they're thinking about fertility. Um, and thank you for your talk. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I want to thank you all for attending. We're right at 10 o'clock now, and this uh, recording will be archived on the FORCE website um, later on this week, and please fill out the feedback form. You'll get a link to that in an email in the next day. Thank you all for attending, and thank you again, Dr. Letterman, for a fantastic presentation. It was my pleasure.